To stay or go? A really big question so many players of the Duke men's basketball team are going to be asking themselves in the coming days, in the coming weeks. Unfortunately, they're having to ask that question much earlier than they would have liked. Duke season comes to an end this past weekend in the round of 32. Now players must decide on their future. We discuss that on Locked On Blue Devils today. Hi, everybody. Dick Vitale. Hey, make sure you listen, man, to Locked On Blue Devils with J.J. Jackson. He's awesome, baby. You are Locked On Blue Devils, your daily podcast on the Duke Blue Devils, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everybody, and welcome into another episode of the Lockdown Blue Devils podcast. My name is JJ Jackson. It's so great to have you here with us on this Thursday, March 23rd, 2023. We're going to be talking about next year for Duke men's basketball, recapping the season that just concluded. Because as we know, now that we've got to this part of the season, we've got to figure out decisions to be made to stay or go for so many of those talented Duke freshmen, whether or not players want to transfer. We'll discuss all of that on today's program. If you haven't done so already, please be sure to follow us on Twitter at LO underscore Blue Devils. I'm on Twitter at underscore JJ underscore Jackson underscore. Make sure that you follow and subscribe to this podcast for free wherever you get your podcasts. Leave us a five-star rating and review and subscribe on YouTube to watch the show daily each and every day. Joining me on today's show, my good pal Connor O'Neill from Devils Illustrated. And Connor, as we've talked about before we started going here today, it's uh, it's off-season mode that we're having to discuss for John Shire's basketball program, as opposed to uh, competitions played in Madison Square Garden with the Sweet 16 ahead this weekend. Yeah, it's kind of funny on my board. It, it kind of feels like uh, within a couple hours of the final horn against Tennessee, it already shifted to, all right, who's coming back? Let's, let's kind of distract ourselves from the pain of this with uh, the, the optimism for next season. And uh you know, as we were talking, you know, um, I travel on my own dime. So my bank account is is kind of relieved that I don't have a trip to the big city. Um, <laughs> my my body, like I got home from New or- I got home from Orlando. I almost said New Orleans there. I got home from Orlando and slept uh, maybe like 16 of the next 24 hours. My body's happy that I'm not headed up to New York. But, yeah, it would have been nice to keep writing stories about this team. I, I thought they were going to go a little further. Um, they just got buzzsawed by by circumstance with a Mark Mitchell injury and then by a Tennessee team that did things to them that other teams hadn't done this year uh, with shoot threes and offensive rebound against them. Without a doubt. And, and it's just sad to see the season come to a close the way it did. The Mark Mitchell injury was something that so many people uh, want to discuss because, Connor, I mean, you were there in Orlando. You were able to watch all of these events unfold and then speak with players and the coaching staff afterwards. Talk to me about that injury saga that we're calling it for, for Mark Mitchell, for lack of better words, because it really caught a lot of people by surprise. It's crazy. Um most of the most NCAA games, uh, they'll come around in the media room before the game and give you a lineup sheet that has, you know, the refs and who the U.S. Basketball Writers Association pool reporter is who has to go talk to the refs and get rulings uh, if there's anything crazy that happens. And they have starting lineups. And the one that they handed out for Duke, Mark Mitchell was on the starting lineup sheet. That's why I had a tweet out there that was like, Duke will start the same starting lineup. It started for the last 15 games That's or crazy. whatever it was. And and so Duke was on, warmed up on the opposite side of the court for me. And even if they were in front of me, I don't know if I would have noticed anything different. Uh, unless, you, unless you know what to look for, I think you didn't see anything change with the way Duke warmed up. So then you're sitting there and uh, starting lineups are being announced and – uh, it, it it goes down position by position. So, you know, Tyrese Proctor has been announced. Jeremy Roach has been announced. And then all of a sudden it's – and starting for Duke is a 6-7 forward from Newark, New Jersey, Derek Whitehead. And you're like, huh? Yeah. What? what? <laughs> what? 
Didn't uh, see that uh, one coming. Yeah. So then the way this works is everybody on TV, it feels like they get more information than the people that are in the arena. Um, so I've got people on Twitter telling me, Hey, this is what they said on TV. He's got a knee injury. He's unlikely to play. Um, I was able to get confirmed uh, around halftime that it happened in practice the day before, which was crazy because we talked to him before their practice. Like Duke had an open locker room for about 40 minutes. And I talked to Mark twice in the open locker room. And he, you know, there was nothing then that said, you know, it's not like there would be any precursor of, oh, this guy's going to go out and mess right. up a knee. Um, and I was able to also confirm that it wasn't a pre-existing condition. Like he, it wasn't, it wasn't something lingering that he'd been dealing with, uh, and kind of playing through. It was just, it, it sounds like he landed awkwardly on it and felt like he could not go. And so, wow. Yeah, that was, that was just crippling. Um, I made sure to confirm with Derek after the game that, uh, Kamwa, I'm, I'm blanking on the first name, but Olivia the guy who had yeah. 27 points for, for Tennessee <laughs> uh, had a career game. It wouldn't, it wouldn't have necessarily been Mark's primary defensive assignment, but Mark would have wound up guarding him a bunch. And you, from my appearances on this show, from what I've written, uh, Mark Mitchell was the glue that held a lot together, especially on the defensive end for Duke. You take him out of the equation and all of a sudden this Tennessee team that everybody wants to crush their offense and say they can't score 50 points, they look kind of decent. It's wild to think about the impact that that could have. And obviously the matchups is something that people want to discuss. And um, yeah, it's it's just tough. It's a what if. Duke still had opportunities to win the game, though, without this Mark Mitchell injury. Uh, which is something that uh, we've discussed a good bit throughout the week. So uh, now so many people turn their attention to the future, and we're excited to see what that looks like for the Stukeman's basketball program. We'll do that after our first time out here on today's show. Locked on Blue Devils here today is brought to you by our friends over at FanDuel. FanDuel is the number one sports book in America. The tournament is heating up, and now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sports book. New customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything from the money line to point scores, three-point shots strained, and so much more. FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with the same game parlay. So don't miss the chance. Get your no-sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. JJ Jackson alongside my pal Connor O'Neill from Devils Illustrated. Connor, you mentioned uh, the world that you work in. You've mentioned the website a number of different times, the community that you've got there uh, at Devils Illustrated. Do me a favor and tell me all about it again. Yeah, Duke.Rivals.com. Um, got some great stuff up there, uh, recapping Duke's kind of trip to Orlando and season in general. Um, and we'll be launching the off season, uh, with kind of as, as the announcements of who's staying, who's going, uh, as those come across the board, we'll have look aheads to what you can expect next season, kind of maybe looking at some changes for John Shire that he's going to look at. Uh, it was it was a successful season. It's a season that ends in a banner being hung, but it's also a season that, you know, you can't, you can't ignore the things that led to Duke's 17 and eight start. Um, obviously if, if you're better than that, then maybe you have a more advantageous second round matchup. So we'll, we'll be breaking it all down there uh, just because the season ends obviously doesn't mean the content ends. Yeah, I mean, as soon as the season ends, people have so many questions to be answered about what's coming uh, with these decisions that players have uh, throughout Mike Krzyzewski's 42 years as a head coach. His coaching tree continued to grow and grow and grow, and therefore so many people uh, had opportunities to go be coaches themselves. So who knows if coaching staff changes are going to be in place for Shire. Like now we'll get all of those questions answered in the locker room and that sort of thing, Connor. After the loss, how quickly does that switch happen? I know there are people that want to get it first and that sort of thing. 
players try their best to sort of live in the moment, but walk me through the atmosphere that you saw. Yeah, really the only the only one that uh, was was able to talk with any definitiveness um, uh, that might be a made up word there. Uh, Ryan Young is coming back. Um, he had, he transferred in after spending three years at Northwestern. Um, he's so he's going to use his COVID year basically. Uh, he might have spent four years at Northwestern. Now that I say it, but. Anyway, he, he came to Duke with two years left, and this year was one of them, and he's going to use the last one next season. And Duke will be happy to have him back. He is a serviceable uh, big man. He's a leader. You can make jokes about his old man YMCA moves all you want, but they're they're effective. Um, he's going to give you some some good you, – you know what you're getting when you put Ryan Young into a game. Uh, and that was a big thing for John throughout the year. Like he, he could go to Ryan Young and he knew what he was getting when he put him in the game. Um, otherwise, it's a lot of, uh, you know, I, I think to, there was one quote from Derek, uh where he said, this was my last game playing with my brothers. And that's a quote you can take a couple different ways. Uh, I tend to lean on the side of, you know, Coach K would always say, this is the last time this team is going to be together. And I, I tend to lean toward that. Uh, I, I don't, nobody comes to mind immediately when I think of somebody who said that and then come back for their next year. Uh, given what we know about Dariq, like it's pretty much guaranteed that he's going to be a first round pick, uh, even despite kind of the stop and go nature of his season with the injuries. I think you can, you know, if there's a, if there's a gray area between penciling something in and writing it in Sharpie, then that's what you should do for Derek. I guess that's a raceable pen. Something uh, like that. Yeah. <laughs> for, being a, for being a draft entrant. I mean, he's, he came to Duke thinking he was a one and done. And I don't think the season changed his mind. Um, but he mentioned something like that, but but then when asked straight up, like, it, was this your last season? It's very much, uh, man, I'm not thinking about that right now. Uh, just, you know, this this was a tough one to digest, um, that kind of thing. It's, you know, you can you can go there in the locker room after that last loss. Uh, it's it's not frowned upon. Like, I'm not going to judge anybody that wants to go there, right? But you're just you're you're so rarely going to get anywhere with those type of questions. People just want to know. So, like you said, you, you can't frown upon asking. They just we, yeah. we got to know instantly, instant gratification by so many to kind of know what that looks like. Because what we do know is that there are five scholarship freshmen coming into play for Duke basketball this upcoming year. A really, really special class, as they typically are in Durham, being put together. And so now. Connor, the, the strategy for this coaching staff is, okay, what scholarships are going to become available that we've got, right? An easy one is someone like Jacob Grandison, who quite simply has no NCAA eligibility left whatsoever. Then it's just a matter of kind of filling out those other spots. Yeah, Jake, uh, Max Johns, and Kale Catchings all graduate and leave. Um, like I said, Derek Whitehead and, and Derek Lively uh, – they weren't Duke's best freshmen, right? Duke had the ACC rookie of the year and neither one of them was, was them was right. him. Right. But they came into Duke thinking they were one and dones. and Derek lively for as raw as he is offensively. I've never seen a player change games more on the defensive end than that guy does. Uh, he is, I, I kind of early, I would cringe at the use of, of the word unicorn to describe him. He really is like he he is a one of a kind defensive seven footer who can move his feet with guards and stay in front of him on the perimeter. That's just that's a special talent. And that's a talent that NBA teams are going to value to say, let's put this guy, you know, maybe he has to go to the G League. Um, maybe he has to put some more weight on his upper body. But I, I think a lot of his attributes right now make, make him a a five NBA five in terms of being on the defensive end of the court. Um, then it boils down to the, the really the three freshmen that have decisions to make: um, Kyle Filipowski, Mark Mitchell, and 
Tyrese Proctor. Uh, I think I think there's a chance Duke gets a combination of all three back. I think it's not out of the realm of possibility that Duke gets all three of them back, uh, which combined with the the class coming in, um, that's a you know preseason rankings are are worth about as much as you can throw them for, <laughs> yeah. but. That's a really good team that's going to go into next season with a lot of hype, especially if you get Kyle Filipowski back. So the optimism is there. Um, you hate to call an injury a blessing in disguise, especially when, as we discussed, it, it played such a huge role in Duke's loss. Right. But if Mark Mitchell has a knee injury that keeps him from working out for NBA teams, his decision kind of gets made for him. Uh, he was not a guy that, played so well this season that he vaulted himself into the same category as a Derek Whitehead or Derek Lively, where you know that they're going to be a first round pick. Um, as unfortunate as it is, it's just kind of the reality of the situation for him. And yeah, I think he would have probably been leaning toward coming back anyway, but removing that, you know, removing kind of the, the workout element of it, uh, that that could be beneficial for Duke's 23-24 season. I, I keep shaking my head because that's the reason we get you back on this program so frequently and it's becoming weekly appearances here because I really had not thought about it from that perspective in regards to Mark Mitchell. But yeah, if this injury kind of prevents you from being able to showcase what you could do at the next level, did you do enough during the season to warrant being selected, to warrant starting your professional career? And that's certainly a conversation Mark is going to have to have with uh, Coach Shire, the coaching staff, his family, uh, and so much more. So still decisions to be made. Stay or go for so many of these Duke basketball players. And we'll continue to talk about those uh, as Locked On Blue Devils here continues in a moment. Locked On Blue Devils here today. We want to make sure that you know about our new podcast here to the network. It's Locked On College Basketball. It's the perfect time of year. March Madness is here. And while, of course, Duke men's basketball will not be participating in the Sweet 16 games that take place here today, other great teams are. For your second listen, check out the brand new podcast, Locked on College Basketball, as experts Isaac Shade and Andy Patton bring you everything you need to know on and off the court. Plus, hear from big name experts, coaches, and players throughout the basketball landscape. It's Locked on College Basketball available on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Winding down today's episode of Locked On Blue Devils, I'm JJ Jackson alongside my pal Connor O'Neill from Devils Illustrated. So uh, Mark Mitchell, his decision coming up. Kyle Filipowski, an ACC Freshman of the Year. We briefly talked about what that decision could be if Duke is able to get Proctor, Mitchell, and Filipowski back for next season. My, oh, my, you're right, what the preseason hype and expectations would be. And then you just simply compare it to year one for John Shire when he pretty much only had Jeremy Roach playing meaningful minutes coming back. It'd be a much different picture uh, with what that team would look back if all those guys returned. Yeah, and, and this is, you know, you, you you hate to turn the last game into the season into a microcosm and say that this is – this is the reason all these other things happen. This is the reason that all these other things need to change moving into the future. But to me, watching a, a Tennessee team with a bunch of grown men, uh, it shows kind of why John said what he said about a month ago or a month and a half ago to the athletic about changing the recruiting philosophy at Duke and not wholesale changing. Like Duke is not going to all of a sudden be bringing in the, 28th ranked class with yeah. a bunch of guys that don't project to be giving you minutes until their junior seasons. Yeah. We don't want to get used to that, Connor. We don't need that <laughs> in our life, but you're going to see the, the average number of prospects per class take a slight dip. It's going to be more like some three and four player classes instead of five, six, seven. Um, this, this year was a seven player class a little bit, you know, a little bit extenuating circumstances with Tyrese reclassifying so late in the process. Christian Reeves was going to redshirt. This next class is a five-player class. The 24 class only has one commit in it right now, and that's Darren Harris. And all due respect to Darren Harris, he's a really good shooter. 
he's not your, you know, he's not Paolo. He's not right. Derek Lively. He's not at the top of the top of the class. So you're going to see Duke kind of change things and try to get some guys that are going to be there for multiple seasons. Again, that doesn't mean they're going to be targeting, you know, guys that are going to be in Durham to long enough to, you know, buy houses, but, but it's going to, it's going to be a little bit of a tweak. And I think John was able to see the benefit, you know, they got beat in the regular season by an older and more experienced Clemson team. It's an older and more experienced Virginia Tech team. Pretty much any team in the ACC was was older and more experienced than yeah. Duke was this year. Uh, sometimes you can overcome that. Obviously, you can overcome it when you win 10 games in a row and win the league. But I think the recipe moving forward is, is going to change a little bit. Um, I don't think you'll see Duke get any kind of dramatic difference makers out of the transfer portal unless they kind of fall into their lap. I think the the perfect transfer reportal guy for Duke will be somebody like Ryan Young. It'll be, you know, Jacob Grandison didn't have the season that he wanted or that Duke wanted him to have, but there's still the role definition there and the role understanding of, you know, I can, I can fill this void for this team and give them 12 to 15 minutes a game, maybe 20 to 25 when needed. Uh, you're going to get those guys out of the portal. You're not going to get, um, you know, I'm trying to th- like Grant Basili for for Virginia Tech. Uh, Brevin Galloway at Clemson played a ton of minutes and got a ton of shots. Um, I don't know. Give me some like uh, Malachi Smith. I think was the guard from Chattanooga that went to That's Gonzaga, right. who Duke fans, uh, at least on my board, wanted Duke to look at really hard when they only had Jeremy Roach as the guard <laughs> on the roster last year. You're not going to get those guys because you're you're just there's two there's two currencies in the transfer portal and it's literal currency it's money in the form of nil and it's minutes and duke as long as they have the returning core that they have or as long as they have a ballyhooed freshman class coming in they're not going to have the minutes promise that other programs can make so what you do is you you go out and find your grad transfers like ryan young um theo john even and those are the guys that, that you can kind of fill in gaps with. Uh, and then you're getting prospects that aren't going to just be nine month stays in Durham. They're going to, they're going to set up shop again, maybe not four year guys, but also not your one year guys. So it showed me it, it just in that Tennessee game, watching, watching the way, watching how much older Tennessee was yeah, and how much more experienced and mature they were that kind of drove home the the nail to me of why John is kind of slightly altering the recruiting strategy. Well, I might not be able to help you out the most right now, Connor, in regards to the names that are out there. I know they will start to buzz once we get closer to the end of this tournament, once way more players enter the portal and Duke starts to figure out, okay, what exactly uh, could help next year's team look like? Because I can tell you absolutely the Malachi Smith discussion Baylor Shireman was a name last year. Uh, A.J. Green from Northern Iowa ended up turning pro. Courtney Ramey. I mean, there were several names uh, in that guard spot that Duke was wanting. All right, so last question before the end of our show here today that I want to discuss, Connor. As we look at next year's roster, this year's team was led by a junior captain in Jeremy Roach, who does have eligibility left at the NCAA level. What is the word out there right now? Is his time in Durham done with this program? What do you foresee in the future for Jeremy Roach? It's interesting. Um, I just, from from being around Jeremy, uh, I might have the wrong read on the situation. Uh, you know, don't don't take what I say to the bank, but my my gut feeling is, I don't know that he wants to do this all over again with an almost new roster again. Um, he's been through so much. He's he's basically already had a college career in three years, right? He had a COVID year where Duke was pretty bad, and he was part of a freshman class that was almost all gone after that one season. Yeah. So then he plays a sophomore season that 
he gets to play with one guy remaining from his class in Mark Williams, and he becomes a, a first round pick. Uh, he sees Paolo Wendell, who was there ahead of him, leaves. Um, AJ Griffin, Trevor Keels leave. His, you know, Trevor Keels, you can't undersell the relationship that he had with him as his high school teammate. Uh, then he goes through this year where he's basically got to be the elder statesman. And he had guys on the team older than him, but nobody more experienced at Duke than him. And he was basically the only one with Duke experience when you boil it down to significant minutes and playing on some big stages. So I just, I've, I've had the feeling all year. I think others on the Duke beat have had the feeling too. And we've talked about it. It just feels like he is, he has been through enough uh, that he might not want to go through another year of this. Um, I don't think you can blame him for that either. Like I, you know, I, I speak from personal experience. Like when I was in college, I wasn't an athlete, but when I, when it was time for me to go, it was time for me to go. Like I, you, you could not have paid me enough. And this is relevant for the time right. where I was in NIL, but you could not have paid me enough to stay in school past uh, when I was ready to leave. Right. So it just, he feels like a guy that he is ready to leave. I don't know what's next. Uh, he's a small guard. Uh, he he has a knack for scoring at the rim, but that's scoring at the rim in college, and it's different in the pros. Uh, I don't know what his NBA future looks like, but I do know that I think he wants to pursue that NBA future rather than, you know, I, I'm not even sure what he improves his sure. stock to with another year in college. It's duke.rivals.com. It's Connor O'Neill from Devils Illustrated, and you're going to have plenty of stories about the decisions that these guys have to make. Links to your stories are there on your Twitter account as well, at Connor O'Neill underscore DI. Appreciate the time as always, man. It's always a blast to talk hoops with you. Thanks, JJ. I really appreciate it. That's Connor O'Neill joining us here on today's episode of Locked On Blue Devils as our show today comes to a close. Thank you again for your support of our program. Do make sure that you follow us on Twitter at LO underscore Blue Devils. Follow me on Twitter at underscore JJ underscore Jackson underscore. That's going to do it for today's show. As always, go Duke. I'll talk to you tomorrow. My name is JJ Jackson. Thank you and good day.